Good evening. I'm John Butler, your president for the Civil War Roundtable. <laughs> it could be that nobody else was willing to take the job, I don't know, but hey. But anyway, um, would everybody please stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, now, I know we got a lot of new people, so anybody that's a new member or a guest tonight, please stand. I, I can't swear to it, but that's probably a record for new guests in one meeting. So I don't know, Wade, we got, you got your work cut out for you. Not putting any pressure on it. Okay. Uh, next slide. All right, just quickly, you saw in the pre-slides the survey. We had 175 responses. If you still want to respond to the survey, just go to that email that was sent out or go to the newsletter, click on the link, respond to the survey, because uh, Monday next week I'm going to cut it off. But I appreciate everybody's responses. The board's now going to use this to tweak what we've been doing. We didn't find any big problems, but there's always ways you can make yourself a little bit better. But I uh, appreciate everybody's effort. This was available to you when you walked in the door. Volunteers. You're going to hear that from me every meeting. So if you want to plug your ears, that's okay. But volunteers. That's how we survive. That's how we make this thing work. That's how you get in here easy, the whole registration process. And remember, over 80% of you that responded to the survey says you want coffee and cookies. To get coffee and cookies, I need volunteers to run it. And I'm not running the coffee and the cookies. I'm sorry. All right? So come fill out the form, volunteer. We'll figure out what you want to do. There's all kinds of things you can do and help. There's a lot of talent in this room. People that were managers, people that were accountants, people marketing, school teachers, historians operational people, there's a ton of talent available to us. Next slide. Just a reminder, if you want to do this, there's the Civil War Institute, the Summer Conference. This is put on by Gettysburg uh, College. They do a great job. We'll put it in the newsletter. They're going to give you a 15% discount. If you make the call to them, they'll give you a discount. It's always a great job. They got 35 speakers. All right, the drawing for the 50-50. All right, for the $85 and the 50-50, one nine one nine six seven. All ah, right, there we go, nice and easy. Okay. Okay, for the free book in the Sutler's Table, 191-990. 191-990. Who's got that one? 990. Okay, see the Sutler's Table at the end? They'll have it, they'll have this little... Uh, ticket and they will uh, take care of you there. All right, now I'm going to turn the program over to Gardal, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. We have a great crowd out here tonight. Uh, you may be pushing the record for post-pandemic in the crowd here, and this is wonderful to see you all here. Uh, many of you, as you saw before, uh, have participated 
in the survey. One of the responses was to look at topics you wanted to have covered. And uh, one of the ones with the highest number of responses happened to be about North Carolina and its place in the Civil War. What happened? Well, I don't think you expect it to come right on the very first meeting afterwards, and we're going to talk about North Carolina. Uh, we have Wade Sokolowski talking about to prepare for Sherman's coming, 1865, operations on the North Carolina coast. What the I asked Wade uh, this evening why the interest in Sherman and the operations on the coast. It turns out when Wade was in the Army, a uh, lieutenant that he was with uh, happened to be a descendant of uh, Sherman and referred to Uncle Billy quite, quite often. So Wade took it upon himself to go and study and learn about Uncle Billy so that he could respond about that. The North Carolina coast also uh, rings a bell with Wade. His father was, at the beginning of World War II, right after Pearl Harbor, was stationed uh, at Fort Macon, uh, where he met the woman he was to marry, Wade's mother, and he was stationed with a coastal battalion, coastal artillery battalion there. And as it turns out, he also has a great, great uncle who was a Confederate and working with uh, the coastal artillery and the Fort Macon area also. So he has great connection with the talk he's going to give tonight. So I will turn this over to Wade Sokolowski with how to prepare for Sherman's Crossing coming 1865 and operations on the North Carolina coast. Thank you, Gar. Can everyone hear me? Excellent. I've been staring at this water bottle for like two minutes. Let me grab a quick drink here. All right. Well, first, let me begin with saying... Um, Last time I spoke here was February 3rd, 2020. And very next month, I think Doc Fonville was supposed to come in the very next month, and everything went south of the pandemic. And actually, in two years, this is actually the second time I'm actually going to stand in front of a, uh, a group um, and do what I love doing. Now, I understand we have some Zoom members out there um, from as far away as Arizona, what I understand. You know, I did a few Zoom presentations, but it, it's tough for a guy like me because I like to move around and move my hands, and I like to see the audience, and, it, and it's tough doing that in front of a computer screen. Uh, but it's good to be back, and I'm telling you what, uh, when I see this crowd here, and hats off to the leadership of this roundtable, because I've, I've seen roundtables here in North Carolina roll up the red carpet and lock the front door and haven't done anything since the pandemic. And here I am right here two years later, almost on the same date, and we've got potentially new members standing out here in this audience. That is great. So hats off to the leadership here and uh, for, for what they do. All right. Those of you who don't know me, I'm kind of like a big 1865 Carolinas campaign kind of Civil War folk. I mean, that's my favorite part of Civil War history. And usually when I, when I come here and talk, it's usually about this guy or something to do with his campaign. Now, tonight, I'm going I'm to talk about logistics. Now, I know what you're saying. That could be boring. You'll show me a bunch of numbers, and, and you know, we'll all be falling asleep, okay? Um, but actually, I, I'm, I'm going to limit the number of slides that show numbers. Sometimes i got to show numbers to, to, to show you the fact, um, but uh, it is an interesting story. There's a lot going on here in eastern North Carolina, and in Sherman's own words, he said, to prepare for my coming. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And I'm going to introduce you, and I'm going to talk this level of logistics. 
all the way from the strategic level of war with the quartermaster general of the army, Montgomery Miggs. What is he doing down here in eastern North Carolina? Dropping it down to the operational level with Sherman's chief quartermaster, Langdon Easton, and then taking it on down where the lieutenants and the captains and the sergeants are and making it where the rubber meets the road every single day. All right. So tonight we're going to talk about that logistics. Next slide, please. Now, I had a mentor tell me a long time ago, Wade, now this won't, in South Carolina, I don't have this problem, but sometimes when you talk, maybe some people in the audience don't know who William Tecumseh Sherman is. Okay? <laughs> it's kind of like, you ever watch the movie The Blues Brothers? When they go into that honky-tonk and they're not, they're not the right band, but they got that chain-link fence and people are throwing long neck bottles at them, you know? It's the kind of reaction you get when this guy's picture pops up in South Carolina, okay? But you're either on one side of the fence with him. Some people are kind of in the middle, all right? Uh, but I want to introduce, so those in the audience who, who've seen me before, heard me before, uh, bear with me for a few minutes. For the few people that might be in this audience who don't know who the heck this guy is or anything about the Carolinas campaign. So let me kick it off. Christmas of 1864. General Sherman has just completed his famous march to the sea. Atlanta to Savannah. And he's going to present the city of, of Savannah to Abraham Lincoln as a Christmas gift. But then the question is, what to do with an army of 60,000 men, hard veterans? There's really no enemy force left in Georgia. What Confederates were around Savannah with William Hardy have went across the river into the low country of South Carolina. The main principal army in Georgia, John Bell Hood, went west out towards Tennessee. And right down at Christmas time of 1864, the Confederate Army of the Tennessee is literally in the lion's mouth trying to escape south from Nashville into northern Mississippi. So there's no one down here. Sherman's boss, Ulysses S. Grant, wants his army moved quickly up the coast via boat to Virginia, where since springtime when the overland campaign kicked off, uh, Cold Harbor, those bloody battles, and then eventually it transitions to that World War I type trench warfare around Petersburg and Richmond. Grant wants Sherman's 60,000 sent north. An infusion of 60,000 veteran infantry into that Union army in Virginia around Petersburg would very quickly turn Robert E. Lee out of his defensive positions, force him into the open, checkmate, game's over. But the problem is there's not enough boats to move Sherman's armies quick enough. And Sherman, this plays right into Sherman. Hey, boss, let me march north to Virginia. I just did it from Atlanta, Savannah. I'm going to march north through the Carolinas, and I'll link up with you in Virginia. Grant approves it, and the rest is history. Next slide, please. Now, while Sherman is in Savannah, he's going to take the whole month of January. He's staying at the John Green House, historic house there in Savannah. You can go there today. He's got a table laid out, got the map laid out, and he puts his finger on Goldsboro, North Carolina. Now, why Goldsboro? Because Goldsboro, by this point in the war, is the very key railroad transportation hub here in eastern North Carolina. You've got three major railroads that come in there. The Wilmington and Weldon, which is in that picture to the top right there. That's the background railroad. That's the Wilmington and Weldon. And the other one up front is the Atlantic in North Carolina down to my neck of the woods here in North Carolina, down by Beaufort and Moorhead City. But then also in Goldsboro, you have the North Carolina Railroad, which runs west out of Goldsboro, heading towards Raleigh, all the way out to Salisbury and Charlotte. So three major railroads. And Sherman knows when he gets here to North Carolina, it's 450 miles from Savannah to Goldsboro. And he's not, walk, he's not marching up I-95, folks. Okay, it's in the dead of winter. Eight major rivers he has to cross. He has to go through this, the low country of South Carolina in the dead of winter. So he has to refit and rearm his army before it continues north. And he knows when he gets to North Carolina, to, he, has to, he needs that railroad from the coast so everyone gets a new jacket, new pants, new shoes, ammunition, bottle of whiskey here and there, that kind of stuff. So that's what's important. Next slide. Now, when Grant approves Sherman's effort to march north, Grant himself is going to initiate two very important things here in eastern North Carolina. And the first one I'm going to talk about is right across the river. 
It's called Fort Fisher. Okay? The second battle of Fort Fisher will incur there in January. and January 15th, it falls to the Federals. Grant knows we need Wilmington. Wilmington, the port. Wilmington and Wilmington Railroad. North up to Goldsboro, we can resupply Sherman. The other thing that, that uh, Grant is going to do that impacts this area here, he's going to order at the very top of the map there, you see John M. Schofield coming across along with Jacob D. Cox, uh, the 23rd Corps. So he, Grant is literally going to grow the force here in eastern North Carolina prior to Sherman getting here. Now Jacob D. Cox that you see up there in the uh, straight up there underneath the Carolinas, that's Jacob D. Cox who lands here at Southport Spends a few days and then attacks north towards Fort Anderson, then Town Creek. So right now, Jacob D. Cox, General Cox, is on his way here uh, to North Carolina. Next slide, please. Now, I do this slide here. This is 1861 to 1864. Before all this stuff starts happening in January and February and March of 65, Early on in the war, the Federals captures Fort Hatteras and Clark along the Outer Banks on Hatteras Island. And then about less than a year later, General Burnside shows up, and they take Roanoke Island. Then they take Washington, they take Newburn, they take Beaufort, they take Fort Macon. But from that point on, North Carolina becomes this sleepy little backwater operation. Usually never more than 20,000 soldiers. You see those little blue circles up there. They're all scattered across coastal North Carolina. And occasionally, yes, occasionally the fox is going to come out of the lair and they're going to do uh, 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 Foster's Raid towards Goldsboro. Uh, Colonel Lewis from the 3rd New York Cavalry is going to come out and do a raid just north of here at King, uh, Kenningsville in Warsaw. And then there's Potter's Raid towards Rocky Mount. But other than that, they typically go back in through the lair. And it's like that. In December of 1864, because eastern North Carolina is not a priority, and it is a bloodbath in the Union fighting in Virginia, they have pretty much stripped this area down to, depending on whose beer map you want to follow, there's no more than 10 or 12,000 Union soldiers scattered up all across eastern North Carolina along all them circles. Next slide. Now that party's getting ready to change. Beginning in January, when the 23rd comes in, now look down there by Wilmington and Fort Fisher. Here comes Sherman by the first week of March with 60,000 men. Ladies and gentlemen, when Sherman comes across the state line headed towards Fayetteville in the first week of March, we've gone from 12,000 Union soldiers in this state to almost 100,000. You think the game's changing? This ain't the sleepy noodle backwater anymore. And there's a lot going on here. Well, 100,000. Next slide, please. When we think of Sherman and we think of logistics, sometimes we kind of oversimplify it. Oh, yeah, Sherman, he sent out bummers, uh, foragers every morning, went out, came back with turkeys and hams and sweet potatoes. All right? But that's really very simple. Yes, that's what they did as long as his army is on the move. The problem with Sherman's army is, when you depend on foraging, you can't stop moving. So you think about when he gets here mid-March to Goldsboro, and there's 100,000 men that's going to hang out here for a few weeks before they move north to Virginia. Can you imagine what 100,000 men would do to Southport, food-wise? So now you, you see in Sherman's mind, his, he, is, he might not be the best tactical commander, but I got to hand it to him. When it comes to planning a campaign, he's usually a step ahead of people. Um, but you see now why he needs that railroad. Because typically in the government trains, when he leaves Savannah, there's about 14 days of supply. Meat ration, bread ration, per man in the army. 14 days of supply. Well, it took 51 days to get from Savannah to Goldsboro. There's 37 days you ain't got food for the men. So how are they going to do it? They're going to forage. All right, they depend on foraging. That 14-day of supply is strictly for emergencies only. And the boys are going to eat good. Trust me, they are. Um, the, the largest government ration that's in the supply trains in Sherman's Army is about 30 days of supply per man for coffee. 
They like coffee in the morning just like anybody else, okay? So understand, just saying Sherman's army is a bunch of bummers, not so when we get here to Carolina, when the army's going to get as big. And oh, by the way, like I said, when it stops moving. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to show you a slide here. This is my first number slide, but i got to show you this. This runs from February, essentially mid-February, to 1 May. And the main commissary depot, commissary in the, in the Army is, the commissary officer handles anything to do with food and feeding soldiers. Quartermaster fed the, the mules and the horses. But the commissary feeds the men, okay? Um, out, of the, out of the commissary at Moorhead, which is the primary depot, look at that, folks. 589,000 pounds of coffee. Woo! That's a lot of Maxwell House, ain't it? Huh? And look at that last, that last row there. For every pound of coffee, there's slightly more than another pound of brown sugar to put in that coffee. Now look at that one in the middle. Those of you who, who, who make visits to the ABC store, okay? Uh, and for my Zoom folks who are out of state, here in North Carolina, to purchase liquor, you have to boo it from the ABC store. You can get beer at a convenience store. I know every state is different, but when I say ABC store, that's what I'm talking about. So all you folks that frequent the ABC store, 11,000 gallons of whiskey. You do the math, you convert that to fifths. It's like 55,000 bottles. I told you I was going to try to make logistics fun, right? Okay, next slide, please. Now, after Fort Fisher fell, General Grant shows up. And with him, he has John Schofield, who's, who's come ahead of his troops. They're still coming down the Ohio and the B&O Railroad. And eventually, they're going to get on ships and head down here. Uh, but they come down for a little strategy session. And Grant is going to meet with General Terry and Admiral Porter. You got Fort Fisher, but you don't have Wilmington. If you don't have Wilmington, you don't have the railroad. So that's what they're going to discuss here. And in this strategy session, Schofield and Grant pretty much decide that Wilmington is going to be the primary port of infantry, excuse me, primary port of entry for all men and material coming in for Sherman's Army. Next slide, please. Next slide. What I'm showing you here is a map of the railroad situation in January of 1865. Those of you that have served in the military know what I mean when I say the enemy has a vote. Well, in this case, the enemy has a big vote. You see the blue star at the bottom of that map? That's Fort Fisher. That red dot right above it, the reason it's red, that's Confederate-occupied Wilmington. And that railroad all the way up to Goldsboro, the Confederates control it. So that's a pretty risky assumption when you think about it by Schofield and Grant to assume that when they get Wilmington, they're going to have a functioning railroad. Now hang on to that fault. Now if we go up the coast where I'm from, Beaufort and Moorhead City area, you see there is a functioning railroad from Moorhead to Newburn. That's from General Burnside when he hit here in 62. But there's a problem. You see, after that, it became a no man's land between Kentston and Newburn. And that, seven, that 17 miles of yellow space you see on the slide here, there's no track. The Confederates pulled it up. Now, if you talk to the crowd from Kenton, oh, yeah, they pulled up the track, and they re-rolled it into iron plate for the album bar on the noose. Uh, I don't know about that, okay? But I do know the Confederates were hurting for railroad iron wherever they needed it, okay? So they essentially pulled it up. But even when you look west of Kenton, once again, it's a functioning railroad, but guess who owns it? The other team. All right. Next slide, please. Now, the minute Grant approved Sherman's movement, the entire month of January, Sherman's going to be writing this guy here in Newburn, Brigadier General Ennis Palmer. He's essentially the senior commander of those 10 to 12,000 12, soldiers here in eastern North Carolina. Now, Palmer hasn't a clue what's going on. He's not, he's, not, he's not read in. But all of a sudden, Sherman writes, how many vessels can, can berth at the Moorhead, Port of Moorhead? How many locomotives got? How many, how many rail cars you got? What's the state of your bridges? 
How about the water tanks? How, how, fun, how far fun? All, dozens of questions. Sherman's wheels are turning, and Palmer's going, huh? Why, why does Sherman want to know about all this? Next slide, please. Well, after Grant finished his noodle strategy session down here, when he was heading back to uh, Virginia, he decided to turn a left into Fort Macon, come through Beaufort Inlet, and take a little visit to the Port of Moorhead City, and let's go see General Palmer. Now, the sad thing is Palmer did not know on the morning of January 29th that his boss's boss's boss just showed up in Moorhead City. And Palmer comes screaming down the railroad from New Bern, and, and they have a quick strategy session, and Grant essentially tells him, you remember the yellow on my map? Get your butt in gear, start moving west from New Bern with the forces you have, and get that yellow turned to blue. And then we'll deal with the rest of the red later. January 29th. Next slide. So essentially, Grant and Schofield are saying Wilmington's the primary port of entry, but Moorhead's going to be an alternate. Next slide. We fast forward to February 22nd. Wilmington is falling. Nothing of importance can be done here. Here's Dodge, chief quartermaster for Schofield. Remember I said the enemy has a vote? Well, Major General Robert F. Hoke, who essentially commanded the Confederate rear guard as General Bragg got skedaddling on up the railroad to Goldsboro, um, Hoke did a hell of a damn job, ladies and gentlemen, of making sure there's nothing here in the port of Wilmington that the Union Army was going to be able to use until they repaired it or fixed it or replaced it. Next slide. To include a 372-foot-long railroad bridge over the Northeast Cape Fear River. You can load all the trains you want in Wilmington. You can bring all the stuff you want to Wilmington. But until you fix that 372-foot bridge going across the Northeast River, guess what? It ain't going nowhere. Next slide. February 22nd, February 25th, we're Sherman. You might heard from Sherman. Well, throughout the campaign, Sherman is essentially in the dark. He gets no messages from Grant or any, anybody else. He's in the dark. In the same way, he can't get messages to Schofield or Terry at Wilmington. But Schofield's reading the newspapers. And guess what happened five days before Wilmington was captured? That's all over the newspapers in the South. Sherman's boys kind of mm, had no fun in Columbia, South Carolina. And a major part of that city no longer stands. Mm -hmm. So, but to Schofield's mind, well, that was the 17th. It's now the 27th. Excuse me, 25th. We're, he's, he, he's probably near the... He's, He's close to the North Carolina line. And remember, Sherman said, meet me in Goldsboro mid-March. Just don't meet me with a railroad. Meet me with a functioning railroad from the coast. But I also want to see piles of shoes, piles of uniforms, and a whole bunch of 11,000 gallons of whiskey. And it's 25 February, and guess what? Everyone's still hanging out on the coast eating oysters. And, Sch and Schofield's getting nervous as a cat. So he summons Ennis Palmer down from New Bern. And it's a rhetorical question when you ask him. He knows the answer. A month later, ladies and gentlemen, Ennis Palmer has not moved one inch west of New Bern since that visit by General Grant. 30 days have almost passed. And Schofield knows. He summons him down. He fires him on the spot. He turns to his trusted general division commander, Jacob D. Cox, tells him to get on the boat with Palmer, head on back up to New Bern, and get things kicking. Well, unfortunately, you had a hard blow down here, a hard northeaster. The Navy couldn't get him back up to New Bern until almost the night of the 28th. But General Cox shows up on 1 March to New Bern, North Carolina. And on March 2nd, what Palmer couldn't do in 30 days, Jacob D. Cox made happen in less than 48 hours. They're on the move to fix that yellow. Next slide. 
Five days later, the Battle of Wise is fought. The first of four major battles in a very brief two-week period here in March of 1865. Arguably the second largest land battle fought here in North Carolina. Will occur at Wise's Fork at Kinston. The Confederates picked up on Cox coming out of Newburn, and now they're going to try to stop him. Now, if I've lost anybody so far talking about logistics, let me give you some 2022 shock and awe. Look at this picture here, this painting. That's March 10th. Those of you who've been on staff, I mean, excuse me, those of you who've been on a tour with me to Kinston, this is the last attack by Hoke and the Army of Tennessee against Cox's fortified position. Next slide. This is the reality, 1 February 22, 22. Thank you, North Carolina Department of Transportation. And I work for the ferry system. That painting is right here, folks. This is the new interchange for the bypass around Kinston. So everybody, everybody can get to the beach a lot quicker. Instead of going about a mile sh south and avoiding the whole battlefield, that's the fight. I'm a big preservation guy. Those of you who give money to Civil War Trust, I mean American Battlefield Trust, please shoot them an email and ask them what they're doing right now about Wise's Fort. Um, there's a lot of strategy sessions going on right now. I got a meeting with the Corps of Engineer Commander out of Wilmington here to talk about this. Um, this is about U.S. soldiers that died here. Next slide. Let me get back on task here. Now, because of Wilmington is such a sorry state, Moorhead City turns into the primary port. Next slide. Now, because of that 17-mile stretch, that's yellow, Sherman's chief railroad engineer, and I wish I had a true photo of him other than this, but his name is Colonel William W. Wright. Those of you who have ever been to Leavenworth, he's the civil engineer that put the railroad bridge over the Missouri River. He helped build the Panama Canal after the Civil War. He was part of that. Later on in life, he's a loner. He accepts a prestigious, prestigious award from Engineering Society in Philadelphia. He's passed out drunk in the street. They throw him in a jail, and he ultimately dies. But here in this campaign, he is Sherman's right-hand arm when it comes to the railroad. He was with Sherman during the Atlanta campaign. When you hear about the Confederate cavalry complain about how we blew up that tunnel or blew up that bridge on Tuesday, and by Thursday, Sherman's got one in his back pocket, it's W.W. W. Wright. And W.W. W. Wright did not go with Sherman from the march to the sea. He went the long route around with his construction crews, with, essentially with Schofield and Cox. So he arrives at Hilton Head on the 28th of January, jumps off the boat. William, how you doing? Get back on the boat, go up to Moorhead City and get that railroad going. So it's going to be his construction crews that do this. Now this is his boys. This is an image here in the Carolinas. I just can't tell you whether it's the Wilmington Weldon or the Atlantic in North Carolina, but this is Wright's construction crew right here doing the railroad gang stuff right here repairing the railroad. Next, next slide, please. Just like with forging, when you typically think of Sherman, you think of him, his boys tearing up railroads, right? That's not the case here now. Uh, they're not making bow ties. Here's Private James O'Connell from the 130th Indiana. He happens to be out of the 23rd Corps, and he gets detailed along with his buddies on that yellow stretch of railroad. And he makes the comment in a letter home to his mama, hey, I'm used to tearing them up more than building them. But here we are in North Carolina building railroads. Next slide. The problem with Moorhead City as a port of entry what you see here is a blueprint in the National Archives from W.W. W. Wright. Here on the left in blue and black was pre-1865 wharf and railroad. These two sketches right here give you a good idea of what it looks like. What you see in red is everything that Wright's railroad engineers did when he showed up here in Moorhead City. He essentially expanded 53,000 square feet of digital wharf. More, the port of Moorhead City went from being able to handle two ships at a time to eight ships at a time. And for the one time in the long history of the port of Moorhead City, it's more important than Wilmington. <laughs> I tell Doc Fonville that. 
Next slide, please. Look at the ships that's coming in. Now, Quartermaster Miggs, this is not Navy doing it. The Army Quartermaster General has owns its own ships. But he calls this period of time very embarrassing. But just to support Sherman, ladies and gentlemen, just to support Sherman. Now, he's the Quartermaster General of the Army. He's thinking big picture, Mississippi River, Gulf of Mexico, Virginia. He's all over the map. But just to support Sherman from the strategic level is 98 ships, most of them contracted. Most of them are civilian merchant mariners. And they're hauling all this stuff to Moorhead City. The problem with Moorhead versus Wilmington, to get in the inlet, the vessel couldn't draw more than 12 feet of water. You know what I'm talking about the bottom of the ship before we hit the bottom. Anything greater than that, they literally had to cross-load off in the Atlantic Ocean, off Atlantic Beach. Now, we're talking February and March, folks. It's a rough time. I work on the ferry. Northeaster is just about every day. That had to be pretty hairy. Um, but they did it. 98 ships. Next slide, please. Now, Everybody in Moorhead City was not happy that Sherman showed up. Let me introduce you to Mary Finney von Ohnhausen. She is the head nurse at the Union Hospital in Moorhead City. I am about sick of Sherman's army. That's her quote, not mine. Um, Moorhead City... As one New Jersey soldier said in 1862, I don't know why they call it a city, Mom. There's only like four houses and three privies. But in 1865, the best-looking building in Moorhead City was the new general hospital that the Union Army built in 1863. So when Sherman's logisticians showed up, they eyeballed her hospital. They ultimately wind up confiscating it, and the Mansfield Hospital is transferred over to Beaufort, North Carolina, but I, I love her quotes um, in regard to that. Next slide, please. One of the major problems that we had coming out of Moorhead City, they had no locomotives. They had like one or two. That's it. Thirteen locomotives were sent down from City Point, Virginia. Thirteen locomotives were put on ships and sent to Moorhead City along with 96 boxcars and flat cars. Now, I scratched my head going like, how in the heck did you get them off the ship? Because Private O'Connell, my buddy from the 130th, 130th Indiana, when he arrived in Moorhead City in the afternoon, he was immediately detailed with a bunch of other privates to help offload another ship that had a locomotive on it. And they worked through the night. But at sunrise the next morning, that same locomotive that they offloaded in less than 12 hours, hooked up to a bunch of flat cars, the 130th Indiana jumped on the back of it, and they're off to Newburn. How did they do that? Here's one possible way here. You see a barge with rail. This is a ramp. You see the locomotive. Essentially, those of you read the North Carolina, I mean, uh, read the North Carolina Ferry, Think of the boat coming in, the ramp coming down on the deck of the boat. Well, the ramp has railroad on it, has, has track on it. And essentially a locomotive either pushes on or pulls off. That's got to be how they did it. Um, it's one of my things I want to hunt in the National Archives. But it's essentially amazing. 15,000 railroad ties they cut in Virginia and sent to Moorhead City to use to rebuild the railroad. Next slide. When we look at the railroad coming out of the, all three ports, Moorhead City, Newburn, and Wilmington, you can see right here, 1,800 cars from this time period, middle of February to 1 May, 1,800 cars came out of Moorhead City carrying supplies, another 400 cars carrying troops. You can see where Newburn is. Here's Wilmington. All the problems in Wilmington. Because essentially what W.W. W. Wright will do, he will fix the Atlantic in North Carolina, and then he would switch his construction crew, crew members over to the Wilmington and Weldon. So you can see where Wilmington's kind of falling behind here, essentially because that railroad don't work. Next slide. March 11th, Sherman has reached Fayetteville, North Carolina. Why is that key? The Cape Fear River. 
That's another line of communication. Downriver to Wilmington. I can resupply my army there. Next slide. On the morning of March 12th, Next slide. Next slide, please. On the morning of March 12th, the Army Tug Davidson will come upriver from Wilmington. And this is the first communication that Sherman will have with the, with the outside world since he left Savannah on 1 February. It's March 12th. Um, this is when he also hears about the trouble that we're having over there, getting, above, getting, getting Goldsboro ready. Okay, next slide. But he's also going to ask for some resupply. And here's the Elos. There's several steamers that will move up and down the Cape Fear. Sherman will hang out in Fayetteville for several days. One, he wants to destroy that nice little arsenal there. Um, he's got to put some bridges across the, the, the Cape Fear that Wade Hampton effectively destroyed. And then he's got several, you know, almost 10,000, seven to 10,000 non-combatants that are hanging on to his army he wants to get rid of. So, but the problem is... All the stuff for Sherman's army, guess where it's at? It's in Moorhead City. So when he arrives in Fable and says, hey, can you send me some uniforms and shoes? They, they essentially only had about 1,500 pair of pants and the same number of shoes. I mean, that's an army of 60,000. That's not going to help them very much, is it? So effectively, they're on their own until they get to Goldsboro. Next slide. The problem you have here in Wilmington now and Dr. Fonville did a great article on the prisoner exchange about this same time period. You have all these prisoners from Florence and, and Salisbury that are half starved to death, you know, typhoid. You got it. They've got that disease. And on top of that, Sherman unleashes anywhere between seven to 10,000 refugees that were hanging on to his army at Fayetteville. And all these individual groups come down here to Wilmington, and poor Brigadier General Joseph Harley has to deal with this humanitarian mess. Okay? This is a great story. And I, I, I stopped in this, this afternoon and spoke with uh, Jim, Jim McKay there at Fort Anderson. He's doing a lot of study on this piece right here. Like I said, Doc Fon was already got this one. But he's doing a lot of the folks. Some of these refugees wound up on this side, of the, down in this area, on the west bank of the Cape Fear. And if I remember correctly, her diary... Mary von Ollenhausen winds up here at Southport as well. Next slide, please. March 22nd. The day after the Battle of Bentonville, Sherman arrives in Goldsboro. Guess what's not there? Yeah, not, the railroad ain't even there, folks. Um, as he tells his wife, my army is dirty, raggy, and saucy. And you can see here on his quote, He's not very happy that his logisticians have failed him. Next slide. The problem is they fixed the yellow, but when they got to Kenston trying to get over the Noose River, guess what? Another 240-foot bridge needed to get rebuilt, this time over the Noose River. So effectively, you don't have trains on the Goldsboro side of the Noose River until March 23rd. Next slide. So Sherman has some very unhappy senior commanders here. Uh, Blackjack John Logan, commander of the 5th Corps, Francis Blair, 17th Corps. They're so upset that there's nothing there in Goldsboro for his men. Only backtrack. While Sherman was fighting the Battle of Bentonville, the very first night at, at his headquarters at Fallen Creek Church, about halfway between Bentonville and Goldsboro, uh, Schofield sent two scouts from Kinston who literally worked their way through the Confederate lines and made it to Sherman's headquarters. And Schofield pretty much told Boss, Sir, there's not going to be nothing in Goldsboro for you. When you get to Goldsboro, have your wagons make the 30-mile round, well, really like 60-mile round trip. I'll have everything sent to Kinston, and we can resupply your army from Kinston. Because once again, Jacob D. Cox saves the day. He coordinates with the Navy at Newburn, And the Navy is running these steamers up the Noose River, pulling barges full of food and uniforms and stuff. This upsets the heck out of Blair and Logan. And they send a letter to their Army commander, O.O. O. Howard. Who, oh, by the way, they're not sending each other Christmas cards. This is, this is Sherman's chief logistician. 
General Langdon Easton. They don't like one another, and this dates back to the Atlanta campaign. He doesn't like him at Savannah because all the horses are about to starve to death down there. So he sends this letter essentially telling Sherman to fire Langdon Easton. Next slide. But lucky... Oh, I'm missing one. Ooh. Okay. But I know what I'm supposed to say. Um, when W.W. W. Wright... There we go. When W.W. W. Wright gets to Goldsboro, the railroad engineer, he walks up to his boss and says, Sir, jump on the train. And W.W. W. Wright takes Sherman all the way from Goldsboro all the way down to the Port of Moorhead City and essentially explains to him every problem they had along the way and showed him what they did at the Port of Moorhead City. And that pretty much, he saved Easton's butt. Um, and Wright and Sherman comes back and essentially tells O.O. O. Howard, tell Blair and Logan just to mess off here. He's not firing anybody who's done a great thing for the Army. Next slide. In the final assessment, Quartermaster General Montgomery Miggs, you see there, he talks about, by the first week of the Army, first week of April, they had effectively reclothed, reshoed, re all new equipment, essentially, ammunition, for over 100,000 men at Goldsboro. Did we have problems? Yeah, probably betting on Wilmington when you didn't really have Wilmington was risky. That was a risky assumption. It did not help that General Palmer essentially sat around for a whole month and didn't do anything. Um, but in the end, you can see the Herculean effort that these guys do. I mean, this is not the Army of 61, gang. This is the Army of 65, and it's a well-oiled machine. When they're doing all this stuff, I'm not telling you that all the prisoners from Aversboro and, and, and Bentonville and Wise's Fort are sent to Newburn on the same train. In less than 72 hours, they arrive at Point Lookout, Maryland at the prisoner war camp. This is a well-oiled machine, and it does speak a lot for these soldiers for what they did here for Sherman in the very 1865. Next slide, please. For those of you who are interested, I do have some books up here. Appendix on this book here does talk a lot about this aspect, as well as my book on uh, Wise's Fork. I've got a whole chapter committed to this. Next slide, please. With that said, let me begin with Thank you for having me. Uh, I hope um, I made logistics kind of interesting, okay? Because uh, it can be dull and boring, trust me. I, I did it for 25 years. But at this time, I'll open it up to questions, folks. And once again, um, thanks for the great support here. Make sure our mic works here. Everybody here? So, uh, Wade, let me uh, start with one question. What, was, what were the civilians doing uh, while Sherman's troops were around? Were they uh, being nasty to them? Did they offer them any support? What was the typical civilian in North Carolina doing while Sherman was around? Well, those, on, those down in, for example, in Moorhead City, in the Beaufort area, it's kind of like whoever's got, the, whoever's got the money, right? If I can make some money working for you, I'm going to do it. Um, those along the march route, those that had any kind of loyalty to the Union, uh, because Sherman's bummers really could not distinguish between a loyal citizen and a, and a Confederate, um, those who lost their homes along the way, or essentially, not so much they lost their homes, but all their chickens and hogs and all, you know, so essentially they, they latched on to Sherman's army for some help. And that's why you have all those refugees. Um, but when it comes to... The, the, the Confederate population, those that were diehard Confederates, um, when a bummer came, some of these ladies kind of held the ground. Um, but it, it depends on what part you're in, okay? Uh, on the coast, like I said, if they can make money working in the hospital, being a laundress or being a nurse, they're going to do it and make money. Questions? Uh, Ryan, grew up. This trouble was called 
the war for Southern independence or the war between the states. I've heard till the start of the 1920s, not before then, it's called the Civil War. Now, why did this thing ever start being called the Civil War? How'd that start? Sir, I really don't, I, that, that's a great question. His, his answer is, some people say war between the saints, war of rebellion, the Civil War. Um, I, I don't know why, sir. I really don't, honestly. Another question. Here we go. There was a, when you had the map up, it was showing, of course, you know, the, the strong points in mm -hmm. terms of the, the Union from 1861 to 64. Mm -hmm. So we know, again, with Polk and the rest of the, you know, Confederate forces and everybody falling back up through in Johnson, what kind of Confederate forces were arrayed within the context of, you know, North Carolina within that would be well, I want to say holding those guys. Essentially, they're concentrated along I-95, the wilmington Weldon corridor in North Carolina. They're guarding the railroad bridges over the Roanoke River at, Wel at Weldon and Garysburg. Yeah. They're at Kinston along the Noose River to make sure if anything comes out of Newburn, we've got the early warning. They're concentrated around Goldsboro, and obviously, Wilmington area here to Lower Cape Fear is one of the largest concentration uh, of Confederate soldiers uh, here doing the lower Cape Fear defenses. Who's, but up. Uh, I'm sorry, who's, who's uh, in charge? Well, who's the senior commander? That's, you know, that's a great question. Who's the senior commander down here? Uh, that changed about every 90 days, my friend. Uh, honestly, I'm, I'm not joking there, and it did. Um, but by 1865, really late 1864, Braxton Bragg commands the Confederate Department in North Carolina. This area down here is a sub-district, then Kinston and Goldsboro is a district, then Weldon, but Bragg is the overall commander. Now, before that, it changed multiple times. Monroe's Crossroads? Actually, John and I were talking earlier, Monroe's Crossroads is something I'm going to try to put together for the roundtable. I'm, I'm usually able to get on there once or twice a year. Uh, they'll let me go on and do a tour. And it's, and it's uh, the, Army, the Army protects that battlefield. It's well preserved and well protected. And, and you almost got to give your right arm to get on it. But, uh, you know, um, I just went on it probably about four months ago. But yeah, it's something we're going to work. We've got a couple more questions. Wait, could you uh, briefly take us from Sherman in Goldsboro to the surrender at Appomattox? What was Sherman doing? Did he ever get to Appomattox? What happened then? What's going to happen when Sherman gets to Goldsboro, he's essentially going to jump back on that train and head on down to Newburn and jump on a ship and head up to Hampton Roads. This is where there's going to be that last famous meeting between Abraham Lincoln we let you test Grant, General Sherman, and Admiral Hoare. They're all there on, on, on the ferry boat there um, at Hampton Roads Conference. Um, Sherman will come back down here to North Carolina. And it's been a couple weeks, so his boys are ready. Instead of moving directly towards Petersburg, they're going to hang a, they're, they're going to continue west towards Raleigh, North Carolina. And on April 13th, Sherman, now this almost 100,000-man army, uh, will now come out of its campgrounds around, in and around Goldsboro, and they all start moving on Raleigh. And the Confederates will evacuate Raleigh on April 13th. Um, Sherman shows up. Um, by that time, every, the Confederate army has essentially move west out towards Greensboro and High Point. Um, 
And then you have the famous couple days of meetings at the Bennett Place there in Durham, where uh, essentially Joe Johnston knows the fight's over. Um, although Jeff Davis wants to keep this fight going, essentially his, Joe Johnston's ready to surrender. And they, they meet at the Bennett Place, little farmhouse there, which is a state historic site. Um, but the armies are miles away. Um, there's that famous meeting there, that first time. That's where Wade Hampton and Judson Kilpatrick about go at it um, while Sherman and Johnson are discussing. But Sherman gets into a lot of, he gets in hot water. Sherman understands, he's not, Sherman doesn't understand the political side of war and the post-war future. And he agrees to some things that really calls us a stink. And don't forget who got assassinated a few days prior. So there's some folks in Washington, D.C. that are really fired up the fact that Abraham Lincoln's dead. And the fact that uh, Sherman, Sherman's almost called a traitor at this stage in the game. Um, he's vilified. Um, and when his army marches north, ultimately to D.C., you know, there, there, you, you can read the stories how he, how he snubs the Secretary of War, wanting, wanting to shake his hand. And Sherman's brother is a U.S. Senator. And, and Sherman's boys are pissed because the newspapers are calling him a traitor. And, and Sherman's brother, John, is like, I'd be glad when, Sherman's, when my brother's army gets the heck out of this town because they're probably going to burn it down here. So things change for Sherman. And the next time he goes back to Johnston, he brings John M. Schofield with him. General Schofield's a lot more political savvy. And he's aware what words mean on paper and what they truly mean and what you may think they mean. And it's a whole different situation. Um, that's kind of how it ends. Hmm? Why was Sherman called a traitor? His original surrender agreement with uh, Johnston gave uh, essentially the issue of slavery. It's almost like they went back to 1861. Yeah, the whole situation changed. I'm sorry, sir. What did he give away? His consent, instead of just surrendering his army, it's almost like the issue, you're, you're, you're gonna be welcomed back into the nation, you're coming back to the United States, the whole issue of slavery, folks, that piece is in there. It gets him in hot trouble. It gets him in hot water big time. And so the next time he comes back, it's simply turning your weapon. Here's, here's a half a dollar for some money, and here's a hot meal. Go on back home. Sign your parole. It's a whole different wording. One final question. This is it. And don't forget your... Uh book signing up here afterwards and your volunteers i know we got a lot of uh, those slips filled out volunteers in that box this is the final question wait Patton was often referred to as a sherman because they didn't politically know how to fight they were great at fighting they didn't know the politics what i'm wondering is when sherman did his infamous march to the sea and he pillaged and burned did he do the same on the way to Fayetteville, number one. Two, did he ever answer for any war crime? Sherman never answered for a war crime. Um, to answer your question, the first part of the march through South Carolina, yeah. South Carolina paid a price. Um, Columbia, you can blame on whiskey. You can blame on wind and fire and a whole bunch of cotton bells and a bunch of drunk Union soldiers and eventually it spread. Uh, loose as the goose when it comes to discipline, that was Sherman. When he came across that North Carolina line, um, there was essentially an order to back off. Okay, the whole attitude changed. And I tell people, Folk, how come you can go to Aversboro and you see three plantation homes still standing? You go to Bentonville, you still see the Harper House standing. The only plantation house that got burned during the Battle of Bentonville, the coal plantation house, was burned by Daniel Harvey Hill, and he's a, he's a confederate. So it changes when they come across the North Carolina line. 
They see South Carolina as the cradle of succession. You're the reason why my brother died at Shiloh. You're the reason why my, I lost my, my cousin at Chickamauga. And now here I am in your home state, and you're going to pay for it. A lot of hands off. Was Sherman hands off? Did he look the other way? Absolutely. Now, an interesting aspect here is there was court-martials conducted when he got to Goldsboro. There was a sergeant from the 12th New York that was hung for rape. There was another sergeant from Illinois that was, that was drummed out of the army. They couldn't prove rape, but they proved the assault. And Paul Branch, who's the historian at Fort Macon, because Fort Macon really wasn't, you know, there's no Confederate Navy to worry about no more. When Sherman got here to North Carolina, Fort Macon became a military prison. Actually, before he showed up. And a lot of Sherman's bad boys are in, that, in Fort Macon in April and May doing hard labor. And one of the issues that I would love to see one day is, what were the, what were the charges? What, what put them in there? You know what I'm saying? So there is some sort of discipline. There's a price being paid once they get to Goldsboro. And we know there's probably 40, 50 of them that are doing hard labor in Fort Macon. So, but what did they do? Was it rape? Was it... I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that one sergeant from the 12th of New York was executed for rape in Goldsboro. Folks, let's give way to another uh, round of applause, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, folks. Come on up. Come on up and get your uh, Sutler's Table hat. Get your Sutler's Table book. Ann's ready to help you there. <laughs>